by Canada yesterday. And so far, one apiece. Francis Collings at the stadium, also Dan Buckingham, gold medalist in this sport for uh, New Zealand. How is this game going to pan out, do you think, Dan? What are going to be the tactics employed by uh, certainly the, the Japanese side? The Japanese side, they've got uh, two main go-to guys. That'll be Ikizaki and uh, Shin Nakazato. So, uh, I'd say they'll be on the majority of the game. This is uh, Ikizaki or Aiki at the moment just passing the ball up. Main man there, definitely he'll be the, the one that the Americans want to have a hit on the plate. He'll be, he'll be targeted all day. The Americans on the other side, a different game. They've just got lineup after lineup, just as strong as the, as the last one that came off. So they'll keep throwing lineups, I think, at the Japan team and just wear them down over the course of the 32 minutes. So when it comes to strength and depth, there's definitely advantages to the United States. That has always been their advantage. They've got a, an awesome league there in the States, a lot of players, and it just creates a huge amount of depth. Well, there's the main man for Japan, as Dan was saying. Uh, Daisuke Izizaki. And he's just knocked down one of the main men for Canada, uh, for USA, Chuck Aoki. There's Chuck. Oh, there's uh, Shen came in from behind and just put him on the deck. Well, I think uh, Shin seemed to uh, enjoy uh, that tackle. Tell us how it feels when you crash into someone uh, and, uh, and effectively upend them, Dan. Yeah, it is a good feeling. I think that's one of the great things about wheelchair rugby is it is full-on contact. You're not allowed to go uh, touch the body as uh, Shin Nakazato did just then. Uh, no body contact, but full-on chair contact. And it's just a fun part of the game, you know, getting that physicality and, and getting to hit another player. And when you can hit them hard enough to get them to hit the deck, yeah, it's, it's a good feeling. Derek Helton, the man who was uh, hit by uh, Shin there, number 13 for the United States. So what happens there with Shin uh, going to the bin? Basically, because he, uh, he fouled the player, he got a bit of body contact. It means he has to go to the sin bin for uh, up to a minute or until the other team scores. So three on four here, USA will just run him for an easy goal, and uh, Shin will come back on court. Joe Delagrev scoring for the USA. Three to one advantage for... Uh the team who are favourites, but then again, they were favourites yesterday. So, uh, as we know in sport, you don't count your chickens and, uh, until they're hatched. Here comes a Japanese number 11, the aforementioned fearsome-looking champ. And forced into the Shin. timeout there. Basically, they've got 12 seconds to get over half. And uh, USA just having a strong full-court press, and, and they weren't even close to getting over half there. So Shin used one of his timeouts, four timeouts, so it's basically a, a get-out-of-jail free card there. Otherwise, it's a turnover ball and possession to the United States, right? Exactly. Exactly. That would be straight turnover if uh, they didn't get over 12. Of course, the other big one is uh, once they get over half, uh, from one end to the other, it's 40 seconds to score. So there's a score clock on there as well. So as a player, how aware of you of the, uh, of the respective times? Are you keeping an eye on big clocks in the stadium, or do you naturally know when you're coming close to your 40 seconds? Yeah, it just becomes instinctive over the years. You just really sort of count it without even thinking about it and you know you're getting close to that 12 and you feel the pressure and you know it's you know it's time to call the time out or go for the Hail Mary at some stage the Hail Mary there's a turn from uh, from the NFL that's when you boom it forward is it to, to, to just chuck it anywhere yeah you know that that 12 seconds is counting down you've only got four timeouts you look up and you look for an outlet and if there's someone there you just get the ball to them any way you can all right Japan on the attack need to uh, get back on the score sheet Shin does that 3-2 after five minutes of the uh, first quarter of eight minutes, of course. Yeah, good, just, good pressure there from Japan, just keeping uh, the US in the, in the backcourt, but Joe Delagrove managed to... Oh! Oh! Managed to get the, get the ball through. A huge hit there on the way through. Well, you could hear the crowd loving that one. That was a good old uh, head-on collision. Iki with the ball, main man for the Japanese side. Great work there from his low pointer as well to get him over half. Uh, often, you know, when you when people do come along to the games, they see the big hits and the big crashes. And then once you're there a bit longer, you see the tactics and see the blocking. As you can see, number six for the Japan there, running a screen block for Shin. Uh, very similar to American football. And uh, Iki as well, number seven, blocking off on uh, the far side, I think, uh, Chad Cohn, just to make the space for the, the player to, like Shin to get through. Yeah, a lot, of, a lot of work going on off the ball. So while the focus is on the ball, there's always a lot going on around the rest of the court creating that play. 
Joe Delagrove again for the USA. Number 14 plays his, uh, his sport for the Phoenix Fusion in, in Arizona in the south. Hasn't been around for a long time compared to some of the other players on this team for the USA, but huge amount of potential there. Uh, one great player the Yanks uh, had there for a while was Brian Kirkland, who stepped down, and, and I think they really needed another two-pointer to step up and, and be that main dominant two-point player, and uh, Joe's definitely got the potential for that. Kazuhiko Kano, number six for the Japanese side, getting on the uh, score sheet there. Same player again. And just speaking of uh, Joe's praises, he just passed the ball away. <laughs> Far too easily, so I think I gave him the commentator's jinx there. Commentator's curse, yeah. You pick someone up and they let you down. Look at that, just too easy, just giving that ball away. There was no thought behind that pass at all. Uh, what do we uh, um, attribute that to? Is that pressure from the, the, the Japanese on, on him in the, uh, in the danger area, effectively? I'm not sure. I mean, there didn't seem to be a huge amount of pressure there. That's why it, was, uh, it just seems so uncharacteristic for any USA player to do that. They're so well drilled by uh, Coach Gumby, uh, James Gumbert. And for, for them to do it, I mean, yeah, that's, as I say, uncharacteristic. So Japan definitely in touch there. I think the Americans huge favourites for this game, as they were last night against the Canadians. But at the same time, they won't be taking Japan lightly. Uh, there was a huge upset earlier this year at the Canada Cup where Japan stepped up and took down the USA. Japan a developing side in this sport. A team that's been there for a long time but never really uh, got up there as far as, uh, you know, they've, they've never been the, the favourites for sure. Uh, they've had some good tournaments here and there. They came, had a great tournament in 2010 at the... Uh, world champs in Canada and got her into a bronze medal position but uh, beyond that you know they've always been there or thereabouts and never quite a, a top contender that may be changing definitely with uh, Ikazaki coming through I mean he's been a, a huge boost to the side and more of their players uh, going through and playing in the US League as well uh, as I said earlier the US League is just huge you know it's uh, so many teams and uh, such a strong competition. A lot of players from around the world play over there. So each team in the US has allowed one international import player. And uh, a bunch of these guys from Japan have done that and got that experience and exposure and, and stepped the game up. We're good combining there between the likes of um, Shin and Ike. American oh. pressure to try and keep them in their own half for those 12 seconds, as you saw. Very close to another turnover there again. So Japan are definitely putting on a lot of pressure on this US side, this US lineup that's on the court at the moment. I'm just wondering how long they'll stay on there. Uh, you know, as the, the American strength is a different lineup, so whether Gumby's going to start looking at other lineups, he can throw out the Japanese side and start to put some more pressure on them. And as you were saying earlier, strength and depth for uh, the American side. So are we looking at a fatigue factor from the likes of? Uh, possibly this player later on and not being able to replace him in terms of quality like the Americans could with uh, when Chuck Aoki goes off, he can bring on the chance Sumners and other big names. I think so. I think, uh, you know, as well, the scene of the tournament, so these guys have already played some big games, uh, Ikazaki and Ching Nag Nagazato, so I think uh, they'll, they'll wear down. They've got to wear down by the end of the game. They have got a, another great player on the bench, uh, Shinichi Shimakawa, so no doubt he'll get some play as well at some stage. Voice of Dan Buckingham from New Zealand is with us, giving us uh, his uh, expert insight into this game. Gold medalist in Athens in 2004. It's not gone too well for New Zealand uh, in recent years in, uh, in this sport. Are you a rebuilding country as well? Yeah, it's been some hard times lately. Uh, definitely not qualifying for this tournament, which is gutting. And this is a team that knocked us out right here, Japan. Uh, we had the qualifying tournament in Korea last year. Uh, two spots available from Oceania, Australia with a well, kind of cut and dried, they're, they're a step above us, both Japan and us for sure. And then it came down to the, the game between us and Japan just pipped us at the post. So hard times there. Uh, I guess ever since Beijing, really, where we didn't perform to expectations, we went in there ranked second and, and strong sort of middle contenders and just didn't do the business and uh, basically lost their funding. So we've really struggled over the last four years. But having said that, you know, some great players coming through, uh, some really Exciting young players, Barney Conifer and Nisi, Nafi Lafano, so 
So hopefully, you know, we'll, we'll be back. We'll be there in Rio and uh, stronger than ever. And of course, you're from a prime rugby playing nation, nation that loves its contact sports. Japan as well, they've got a developing uh, rugby setup. Yeah, you just mentioned rugby in New Zealand and people want to know about it and, and find out about it, so it definitely helps us out a lot. Yeah, thank goodness uh, rugby's not a prime sport just yet in the United States of America, given their uh, college sports and the populations they have and compared to New Zealand and Britain and Japan. So American have uh, got some new players on here, but uh, not going well. They've uh, turned the ball over now. Just ahead by the one point, heading towards the end of the first quarter. Iki for Japan, number seven, man who's everywhere. That was just dominant, just slid past Andy Cohen and then uh, went on a big race for the line with Seth McBride. He's got some wheels, Seth. He's, he's not a slow player, and uh, if he just burned past him. This is Will Grew. Japan looking to uh, block him in and uh, get a turnover ball. And another turnover. This is not going the Americans' way at all. Good pressure from the Japanese. Delight on the bench. So struggling to even get the ball in here. They've got the, the player has to get the ball in within 10 seconds. And uh, Andy Cohen fighting through the, the reaches of the Japanese players. So Japan just putting a lot of pressure on that ball, but just pushing it too far and, and uh, getting a bit of body contact there. Oh, a bit one of the chops as well. So Shin Nagazato will sit on the sideline until the Americans score. And yeah, they'll just run it in easily. Well, Shin uh, Nakazato is a man who puts himself uh, about. Not the first time he's been uh, in a bit of bother. No, he definitely pushes the envelope. A really good player, a lot of agility. He can just turn that chair on a dime. Kazuhiko Kano is the number six for Japan. Iki the number seven. Hosuki Izakaki is, is his full name. And this is a chance for Japan to go out for the first time, I think, in the match. And there it is, 11-10. So what is Jim Gumbert on the uh, American bench going to be making uh, of this? Coach Gumby, uh, I mean, he's a cool, calm, collected man. I'm sure he'll... And, he, and he's such a smart man as well. He knows this game inside out. So he'll be... He'll have uh, plan B, C and D already lined up. And uh, I think he might be, it might be time for him to start going to one of those. As the Americans struggling to get over half there and having to call a timeout. And Shimichi Shimakawa, number 13 there on the right, getting excited. He's been the main man, the mainstay for Japan for a long time. And uh, hopefully we'll get to see him on the floor at some stage. He's just got some phenomenal wheels, a lot of speed. Uh, smart player again. Been around the game for so long and, and knows the game so well. Ikezaki plays for the Hokkaido Big Dippers. Great name for a, for a team, I think. Change the lineup for the Americans, so Chan Sumner on. Big man on court. Yeah, he's the number one up the uh, center. And Scott Hogshead there, number eight. He's a one pointer. So, less function, but does a huge amount of work and just chipping away there at uh, Ikezaki. Now he swings around to take the corner of the key and just spreading that key. So a lot of a lot of things happening off the ball, just trying to set up this play as uh, the Japan fall into the key defense. So basically that oblong at the end of the court there, you're only allowed three defenders on that. So the, the two main uh, defenses, I guess, the full court press, which the Americans have got going right there, and then there's the key defense. And huge play there by the Americans. Yeah, Shin out of court that. just before he could pull time out. Joe Delagrove, Chance Sumner doubling up on, uh, on Shin there. Ball. Two Some big fire. boys for the Americans there, putting the weight on Shin. Some fired up players. Same two combining this time to score. 
Sumner to Delagrave. USA back in the lead by uh, one point at the end of the, the first. And that's big to score last at the end of the quarter. Teams want to score last and first at the end of each quarter. So basically, uh, you win the tip at the, at the start of the game, and then whoever doesn't win the tip gets the arrow for the next quarter, so gets the start the next quarter. So if you, if you can score last in the quarter and then score first in the next quarter, it's almost like getting an extra point and you go. Getting double. Up. So in these tight games like that, that's a huge play to be able to finish and score right on the buzzer. Well, it's been impressive from uh, Japan so far, from the, the likes of uh, these two players, but uh, as Dan Buckingham has been telling us, there is strength in depth on the, uh, the American team roster. Coach uh, Gumby, James Gumbert, has the ability to, to mix it up and uh, see if he can take the heat out of the, uh, the Japanese attack through the likes of uh, Shin and Ike. Shin, the number 11, EK, the, uh, the number seven. So this is quarter time, just two minutes here, and then they're back into it. Really impressed with the way the Japanese team are playing. They're just, they're sharp. They're looking good. Manabu Tamura is the uh, number nine on the Japanese side. Chakaoki, another player from uh, Arizona, plays for the Tucson Pterodactyls. Chance Sumner down the road in Phoenix. So it looks like they're sticking with the. No, they've, they've had another change, the Americans. It look like, looks like Adam Scaturo was on. Chance Sumner still on there. And Jason Regeer and Chakaoki. So this is called a high low lineup. Uh, often teams have a, a balanced lineup where the classification is sort of similar across. You might have one high pointer with a couple of mid range players and a low pointer. And we're talking about classification of, of impairment, which is something the coaches have to juggle in, in this sport and also wheelchair basketball. Each player is given a certain, is rated a certain number. It's a huge part of the game. Is, uh, each player is uh, classified, they're assessed by a team of physiotherapists and doctors and uh, given a rating depending on how much function they have. So to be eligible to play this game, you have to have impairment to at least three of your limbs. So the majority of the players are tetraplegics. They've had spinal cord injuries, but then uh, some other disabilities in there as well that have taken uh, three to four of your limbs. From that, you're giving a rating from 0.5 to 3.5, going up in 0.5 increments, about uh, depending on how much function you have. And you're only allowed eight points on court. So out of the four players on court, it really comes down to combinations uh, often when I was playing, or when I am playing as a three-pointer, I often work really well with a one-pointer, so we'll come on together as a combination. So rather than straight subs, as uh, players on and off, it's often combinations going on and off. Adam Scaturo getting on the score sheet for the American side. Two points advantage. Of course, the other big thing with classification is it's often contentious and, and different teams around the world sort of challenging what a player should be. But the classification is done by your own Paralympic committee effectively or is it done independently? When you start the sport you're often classified nationally so you will have your uh, own classifiers within your country and then you become internationally classified by, by an international board uh, and then it, you know two or three times before you become a permanent status um, and teams can't challenge you anymore so just going back uh, when I was first classified I was classified at one event and then reclassified and then a team it was actually Team USA challenged my classification, so I had to go through the process again and just ensure I was what I was. And was but your classification correct, or were they corrected in uh, challenging you? Uh, no, I stayed the same, so it always been a three-pointer. But some players do change. Uh, Adam Scaturo there, as an example, started the, the game as a two-point player and then went down to a 1.5, which is huge. As you know, when we talk about combinations again, to be able to drop half a point and come on with someone with more function really adds to a team. So to drop or, or go up a half point classification is, is massive. And it's been a, it's affected teams here at these games. France came in uh, and had some classification issues. One player ended up being classified out of the game and another player went up. So really affected their campaign. Some big hits coming in today. That's what the, uh, the fans want to see. It's what the players enjoy. Adam Scutter had a chance. Sumner 
near side uh, Jason, Jason Reggier of the Denver Harlequins, the uh, number seven. Just getting the feeling that the Americans feel like they're starting to settle a bit more into this game. Starting to get a bit more of that control. And they ease up to two points over now. Two points above the Japanese team. Japanese, the, the earliest thing they seem to have has just been a little subdued now. Remind you, watching the bronze medal match between the United States and Japan, not everyone expected this match off to occur, but gold later to be played for by Canada and Australia. Canada, the uh, somewhat surprise victors over the American side on Saturday. Spirited Japanese performance, though, from the likes of Ike being shepherded by Aoki inside the key, but... Uh, Man has got manoeuvrability. Yeah, great player, Iki. Great agility to be able to turn his chair and, and just speed to match it as well. And just a smart player as well. He doesn't seem to do a lot wrong. He puts himself in the right places. Just like this man does as well, Chuck Aoki. Just explain what we see occasionally, and we saw it on the, I think the last point but one when uh, Chance Sumner scored, where he'll park himself on the key, on the goal line, waiting for a Japanese defender to come, when of course he could have rolled over like Chuck Oki there to score straight away. Why is he waiting there? What's he doing? Yeah, just uh, taking down a few seconds off the clock. I think at that stage there was uh, one of the Japanese players in the bin, in the sim bin. So they were just sitting up the next play and already looking ahead. So Chance just giving his teammates time to set up. Uh, I think they were trying to tra trap the player on the bin. So what happens there is they put a couple of players around the bin so when the the player has to come on, he's, he's straight into a trap and can't go anywhere. So just very tactical. I mean, uh, you know, you see the big hits, which are awesome, but a lot of tactics going on in this game. And very close to a turnover there. Japan just managed to pull it back in and, and get the goal. Getting low on the shot clock there as well. I think they're down to about five. So only 40 seconds to score a goal. That's the clock that you can see in the top of your screen that uh, the fans have got an eye on that you're here being uh, counted down. 12 seconds to get over halfway, 42 to score. There shouldn't be an issue on this occasion. Oh. Cut him down and you get some pressure on this guy. This could be a turnover. And just pushed it too hard and that's a reach. Yeah, I think I spoke too soon there. Adam Scutura getting nicely boxed in. Shin goes in for the ball here and just pushes it too far. I think we'll see a bit of body contact here. Uh, just cut off a bit early. And that's why Shin has now gone to the Simbin. Shin in the Simbin again? I just uh... So again, Chance will just hold up the ball here while his players sit up and just wait for Shin to come on so that Shin goes straight into a defender. USA just trying to work the two main men out of the game, Shin and Eki. Basically, they don't want the ball with this guy who's got it right now. Oh, terrific play. That is awesome teamwork right there. Look at that. They just know where each other are. Skatura again for the United States. And I guess when you're getting down to teams that are evenly matched at this stage of a competition in a medal game, it's the turnovers that can prove vital given one side's ability to uh, only stay ahead by one or two points at any one time. Yeah, one turnover can be huge, you know, it could be the winning or losing of the game. As we've seen uh, with last night's big game, you know, Canada, USA just coming down to one point. And that was really a massive game. But Canada have a, a bit of a reputation for doing that to the US in major tournaments. You know, they're the ones that uh, knocked them out of the final of the 2002 World Champs back in Sweden. Um, 2004, of course, beat them in the semi-final to make USA play off the bronze. And then they've done it again here in London. Chuck Oki, one of the uh, fine players for the United States, you see him there, number five. He was the man who committed the, the foul with 30 seconds to go against Canada. Gave them the ball, gave them the chance to score, gave them that one-point win, and it's 
comes down to fine margins at this level as this American team found out painfully yesterday. Yeah, definitely pain, painfully. I think they really would have been hurting last night. Just uh, big favourites, as they always are, you know, just being the team that they are. But uh, I think they would have been looking forward to the show off with Australia. They would have been heavily favoured this tournament as well. USA ahead by two. Japan won't want to let them get too far away. Close to a turnover there. Chance just managed to strip the ball off the lap of Ike, but it's called off Chance's hand. So it'll be, still be Japanese ball. And Pierre, Canadian ref, just passed the ball over. It's playback started. Thunderous challenge coming in from Seth McBride on EK. Nothing seems to stop this man. It just makes it look easy at times, doesn't he? He's got a fabulous turn of pace. Norihisa Iwabuchi is the coach of the Japanese side you just saw there. USA got a new lineup on and they turn the ball over. Andy Cohen. Pretty unchar uncharacteristic for him. He's usually safe with the ball, but just pops the ball out of his lap then. Not even sure what happened. Just just didn't get hold of it, didn't Cohen? Not at all. It was like he was thinking about what he was going to do before he even caught it. And just didn't get a very nice touch to it there either. Derek Helton, the number 13. Another player from the Tucson Pterodactyls. So the USA running four two-pointers here. A really balanced lineup. Uh, basically, every player on court could, could carry the ball, could run with it. But at the same time, it's a bit of a trade-off because they don't have a dominant player on court in terms of a high-functioning player like Ikazaki for the Japanese side. So, Technic, was that a, a tactical timeout there by EK with the uh, struggle to get towards the halfway line or, uh, do, or, or one where he needed to... Uh, to reassess with the rest of the coaching staff. No, I think that was getting out of jail free, uh, pulling one of those cards. You know, they've got four of them in the match and they're just pulling really close to that 12 second to get over half. So he just pulled it, you know, keeping it safe at this stage. They're still within reach, two points down with the ball. So should be one point down shortly. So I think it's just at the stage of the game where you don't want to take big risks. And USA falling back into the key defense now. So they've just got, they're only allowed three players in that orange area Around the, around the goal line. And this will be a work play for Japan. They have the two players on the outside trying to spread the key, spread the defenders, and create an alley for Ikizake just to cruise on through. How difficult are these chairs to maneuver compared to a chair that you would use in everyday life? Because they look pretty hefty. Yeah, they've got a bit of weight to them. It's a bit of a, you know, it's a, it's a balance between being light enough to push fast and having a bit of weight so you can can head and take the hits. But maneuverability-wise, they're awesome. You know, I first tried one when I was still in a spinal unit after I broke my neck, and it just felt so easy to push and just free. You know, you just glide around the court uh, compared to sort of just pushing around in the day chair, you know, big old hospital chair, isn't at that stage. So yeah, they're great to push, and uh, the great thing is you look at these players and they. And they, as I say, glide around the court and look really agile. But when you take them out of that environment, you know, they haven't, often haven't got a lot of function. Some of these guys, you know, don't have full use of their triceps or biceps. And you wouldn't guess it when you see them on court and, and the skill and athleticism they have. <laughs> Huge play there from the USA, pushing Aikazaki into the corner. So didn't, you have to get two wheels over the line to score the goal. And they just pushed him into that cone, pushed him out of bounds before he could get two, two wheels over. Joe Delagrove pumped up. Number 14 for the United States. They're definitely good at celebrating their successes, USA. They get pumped up. They are a pumped up side to play against. Derek Helton with that score. Still that two points gap over Japan. Japan have only been in the lead once so far in this game, but they haven't been out of touch at any any one stage at all with the likes of uh, Shin 
and Ike. And another turnover there from Japan. So they're struggling to get over 12, uh, over half in 12 seconds. And Shin had to go for the big pass and it just couldn't connect. So USA with time to burn now, just setting up this play and looking to go three points up. As we get close to the end of the second, this is a bit of tactics as well. With 40 seconds on the clock, they want to score with enough time there that Japan have to score to leave less than 40 for the US to score last, if that makes sense. There's a lot for these players to think about. I'm there sure it is. becomes second nature after a while, but um, it's, it's more than just the big hits that I think uh, a lot of us learn from seeing the, the murder ball documentary of years ago. Yeah, and there's some big hits that still make it fun, you know, <laughs> even yeah. after all these years. That's, that's what I love. And, uh, but it's funny, sometimes people ask, why are they doing that? What's, what's happening? And you kind of have to think about it and, and explain it. But as you say, it's just, as a player, it just comes second nature. You just do it. And it's uh, kind of the things that, for you, are a no-brainer. You know, you want to score last at the end of the quarter. Um, you know, in your head, you know that you're coming up to 12 seconds to get over half. It's just things you do without thinking about well, this is why we're glad that uh, Dan Buckingham is with us, a uh, gold medalist at this event in Athens in 2004 for the New Zealand side to um, explain the intricacies of murder ball. And this is a hard one to explain here, and people struggle to comprehend oh. this. USA just burning the clock, winding down. They want to score last in the quarter, and uh, they call time out there. Uh, basically, the shot clock was getting down to two seconds. Still 14 seconds on the on the game clock. But if you call a timeout, it resets the shot clock to 15 seconds. So they will get the last to score in the quarter here. Or well, that's their plan, at least. Well, Charles Sumner looking uh, completely impassive in uh, in the face of that uh, furious attack coming in from Daizuki Zazaki. He's a number seven. Terrifying uh, looking chap when he comes at speed, but some are really not at all interested. Yeah, I think he's a little annoyed just quietly. Uh, he came in and basically tarcoed as well, broke a few spokes or maybe bent an axle. So there's a quick change there from the sideline. So he's counting down now, 10 seconds on the clock. So you always say, want to score as close to zero as they can, get the last to score in the quarter. And he'll just ease over the line with not enough time for Japan to score again. And a smack from uh, the same man for his trouble. So three points advantage for the United States. And that'll take us into the half. So now they have a five minute break and come back for another half of this. Well, it's been a pretty action packed game. Well, the coach of the Japanese side, uh, Norihisa Iwabuchi, looking not at all unhappy with his side's uh, performance so far there within three points at 24 21 good supporting play of uh, the likes of Kano number um, six for Japan Starman of course being uh, the aforementioned uh, Ike and, and Shin who's been everywhere including the Sin Bin more than once but uh, what is coach Gumby going to be thinking about during this five minute breakdown Coach Gumby, I mean, he's, uh, he'll G the players up. But the big thing about him, he's a very tactical man. I think he'll stick to, the, to what needs to be done and not worry too much about the you know, semantics around getting the players all amped up and that. I think he'll be all about the play and the lineup and what's going to happen next and just looking ahead, controlling the, the controllable, uh, which is right, what's right in front of them. But Japan, yeah, very much still in touch here. Only three points down. Uh, this, is, this game's definitely there for them if they can, if they can pull it off, if they can continue what, what they've been doing this half. And, uh, you know, a few passes that, uh, that didn't quite go their way and, and went the way of the Americans, if they, if they can just get those ones, you know, they could, they could cause another upset here. Yeah, it's been a good performance so far by the uh, Japanese side. Reminded coming later, Canada against Australia for the gold medal. In Canada, Dan, I guess, are going to be flying and full of confidence after beating the USA, albeit by just the one point yesterday. Yeah, it'll be interesting to see how they came out. It was a, a huge game, and, and um, you know, they would have got back and got the usual food and fluid and recovery and, and maybe a bit of a video session about the Aussies. And But I think, you know, a big game like that is hard to bounce back for another big game. So whether they've got more in the tank, we'll have to wait and see. And Australia are just looking sharp at the moment as well. 
Who are the players we should be looking out for later on in the day in, in the gold medal game for uh, for these two sides? The main man, without a doubt, for Aussie is Riley Bat, uh, best player in the world right now. But he's got some great support there with uh, Chris Bonds, come through strong recently. But the two uh, other guys to really watch out for and often don't get a lot of credit for their work is Nazim Odum and also Ryan Scott, 2.5. So they're low functioning players, but just do a lot of damage around the court. Definitely Nazim, uh, just been around forever and got the flowing uh, black locks behind him. He'll be screaming around the court, just doing a lot of damage behind the scenes. Canada, they're, they're pretty strong across the board. Uh, really well coached. It's the former American coach, Kevin Orr. So he's coaching Canada now. Also my ex-coach when I was playing for a team out of Alabama. Uh, great coach, done so much for the sport. So personally, I'd love to see him get up there and, and get his team to, to get a win to get the gold. Uh, also got some really good mates there on the Canadian team. I played for Quebec, uh, had the privilege of that one year. And so Patrice Samard and, and Fabian Lavoie. Also on that team, there's, uh, I ran into the other day Dave Wilsey and Ian Chan. Uh, this is before the competition started. And they said uh, when they heard I was commentating, they said if I get a chance, just put out there that they are single and, and uh, available. <laughs> so, all right. Well, uh, so make sure, yeah, check out Dave Wilsey and Ian Chan. A couple of good looking dudes there. Yeah, yeah. Find them on Twitter. Direct message. Preferably direct message, otherwise it could be a bit embarrassing. But, um, well, interesting uh, times for uh, the United States team, picking themselves up after that defeat. Having to play Japan for the bronze medal. But, uh, you know, we've seen tremendous passion in, in all games so far, Dan, in this sport and the one that's closest to it, which is the, the wheelchair basketball. Uh, of course as well and whether it's a sixth or seventh place player for fifth or sixth there's no quarter given and none taken no there's a huge amount of passion i mean these guys put their life into into getting to the stage and, and being able to play here at the big show so it is it's massive and it's great to see as well you know you can see with the crowds that pull in and all the talk that's been around the rugby and the basketball and all the media hype uh, it's all through the papers and there are other sports where you know, there's a lot more medals available like you know swimming and athletics Whereas uh, I guess a country takes away a, a team of 12 athletes to play wheelchair rugby with the hope of just one medal. But I think it's more than just a medal, you know. The, it's the being able to say that you're, you're the wheelchair rugby gold medalist or the wheelchair basketball gold medalist. A team sport like that is something else and uh, worth more than just a medal. What was the reaction back home when you guys won the gold in 2004? It was amazing. It was um, I mean, the feeling was beyond words. It really is uh, It's one of those things that you just carry inside inside you, you know. It's more than the medal. But the, the reaction was phenomenal, you know. I was really surprised, you know, just recognised around the streets and so many people would just come up to you and, and say how much it meant to be in, which was, you know, I don't know, I guess so humbling, really. Well, I guess as well in those days, it was a uh, New Zealand rugby team proving itself at world level, which hadn't happened for quite a while, certainly not until last year. Yeah, we, we struggled with World Cups there for a while, and it was a bit of a relief last year, I think. The nation breathed a collective sigh. Oh, yeah. The All Blacks won. And such a tight game against France in the end as well. Yeah, if you're a fan of rugby, you'll know that the uh, French side have been the nemesis for New Zealand doing more than one World Cup going down the years, 2007. Uh, also 1999. Two passionate rugby playing countries. Saw a spirited performance by the uh, French wheelchair rugby team the other day as well another developing side at this level yeah, pretty fresh on the scene the French team first time they've been at the Paralympics so great to see another nation coming up you know, the sport's just getting stronger and stronger around the world so three point advantage to the United States ahead of Japan Chuck Oki number five for the USA there's still the two main men there just working away for Japan as uh, USA have thrown several lineups on. Will they go the whole way through, Shin and, um, and uh, Ize, for Japan, or will they be arrested at some stage by uh, Koichi Iwabuchi? I think at some stage, you know, I really expect to see uh, Shinichi Shimakawa. He's just been a player that's done so much for Japan over the years. Uh, I'd love to see him on court, and he's still a great player, you know. Um, I guess since Ikazaki's came to the fore, he's, he's struggled to get uh, as much court time, but still, you know, a lot of skill. And another turnover there by Japan. So it just feels like USA just inching away. There's a second turnover this half already. 
turning the screw. That was a Kazuhiko Kanu number six for the Japan side. A bit of a smile there even from Coach Gumby. Yeah, perhaps he can uh, see this opening uh, minute of the uh, of this quarter as slight watershed for for the American team. Yeah, just chipping away, wearing down on the Japanese side. Derek Helton with that score. 27-23. What can Japan do about this to get back into the game? Yeah, it's. Uh, I mean, they haven't really got a lot of many more cards up their sleeve. These are the main guys on the court now. And uh, they've got to be tied. End of the tournament. Being pushed all the way. Some big games. How tough is it to come into an event like this and have to play and rest and play and rest on effectively consecutive days sometimes? It can be, uh, yeah, it can definitely get you down, um, especially if you're not getting a lot of rest, if you, if you not, haven't got a lot of, um, I guess, depth in your bench. Uh, often you go away at tournaments and you can play, you know, up to, you can play a couple of games a day. But these games here at the Paralympics, World Champs, Paralympics, they're so intense. You know, a, a game a day is more than enough. And it can be hard to recover from. These Jacob. guys will have all the support they, they need. You know, they'll have the nutritionists, they'll have the massage therapists. Um, they'll have plans and places for recovery, but it's, uh, it's still tough. Also got those guys around at Otto Bock who hammer the wheelchairs and weld them back into, into shape, which is quite fascinating to see. Yeah, the chairs take a huge amount of, uh, I guess, hits and damage. Uh, they do need to get welded, a lot of broken spokes um, out of alignment. People see the big heads, but it's, I guess it's not too hard on the body. It's a lot harder on the chairs than it is on the body. The main injuries we see with, with wheelchair rugby is a lot of overuse injuries. Uh, the shoulders just doing the work that, that they're not supposed to do. And occasionally you'll have a, you know, a black eye or a bit of a cut. But you hit the deck too hard. Chuck Oki with that score for the United States. EK needs to uh, get on the score sheet fairly soon. Oh, nice blocking hit coming in from our friend Shin, who uh, is the sort of player I think who, uh, it's fair to say he welcomes the physicality of this sport, uh, the uh, Japanese number 11. Yeah, he's good at hitting, uh, definitely in close quarters, you know, he's, he's got that full trunk control so he can get in there and just throw his chair into the hit. Just like that. Yeah. Here's Oki again, support on the inside. Derek Helton scoring again for America. Six points gap. Six points this late in the third. That's looking pretty comfortable for the US now. And Japan are really going to have to, they're going to have to pull something. I'm not sure what they've got, but they need something here to start getting some turnovers. And I guess given that uh, generally when you have possession, a good team seems to score turnovers is the only way that you can actually start to draw down this deficit. Yeah, and they need to create pressure somehow. And uh, at the moment, it just feels like they're, they're sort of, they're not going through the motions, but they're just doing the same old, same old. And um, they need to change up. They need to do something. Because USA are starting to look comfortable. All right. USA on the ball again. Joe Delagrave. Oh, back over half. Did he call timeout? Oh, that's a big call from referee Phil Washbourne. Uh, I think um, he may have been back over half there. So as we talked about earlier, you know, you got to get 12 seconds to get over half. And then if you go back into the backcourt, then it's a turnover. So Jap Japan just caught him right on the line there and pushed him back over that half. But the ref called, you know, it was a timeout first. So uh, the, the ref called the timeout or Delagrave called the timeout? Delagrave was calling the timeout, but the way I seen it, it just looked like he was back over half before he called that timeout. So it's that fine line when it comes down to the referee's decision, which happened first. So the, the referee saying that he called timeout before he went back over half. So Joe would have known that halfway line was coming up. He would have known a Jap Japanese player was going to hit him, and he just called that timeout. But well, whether he called it in time, that's uh, up for debate, I guess. Still a six-point gap, thanks to that score by Oki. Oh, 
Nakano for Japan on the attack. Back to Ike. And they want to get that ball back to Ike as soon as they can. The main playmaker. Kotaro Kishi is the fiercer looking champ with the eye goggles, number 15 for Japan. On the near side. Good pressure here from the Americans. That 40 clock's got to be running down. But Ikezake finds a way through. Oh, another player down. Going in for the big hit, and uh, he ended up on the ground himself. The time taken away for the Japanese, running out of time to make a difference here. Worth mentioning as well that players aren't allowed to get themselves back up onto their feet. You've got to wait for the guys to come on with the rubber mat to make sure what you don't damage the court. Yeah, there's, uh, you've got to wait there and uh, basically for a stoppage in play. And then uh, you know, you're strapped into your chair so the players, uh, the staff come on, just put the player back on their feet, back on their wheels. And straight back into it. So Japan, they couldn't get the ball in. They've got 10 seconds to get the ball in there. And uh, just couldn't find an outlet, couldn't get the ball in, so called a timeout. We're going to get a timeout count from the ref there, just uh, they've got to be close to using up all four of their on court timeouts. They do have two other coach timeouts, so a coach can call timeout from the side during a stoppage in play. And uh, that's more of a tactical timeout often. EK getting some running repairs to those arms that are doing a lot of work for the Japanese side. Yeah, he's got a lot of coverage up on those arms. Uh, you see all the players with different sort of gloves and strapping techniques to protect their arms from the wheels and uh, just get a lot of scrapes and burns. But also the gloves help grip the ball because these players, basically everyone here on the court has some, some uh, reduced uh, function to their hands, uh, some more than others. So they'll wear their gloves that have got a grip to them but they'll also put tack on that so they'll have like a Sort of a grippy sort of tack. It's called clister, and uh, it helps just hold the ball and pack the ball better. Sounds like Shin got a flat tire there in the backcourt, so just calling for equipment. So once he's a stoppage and play, uh, staff will come on and change his wheel. There's quite a support staff who are doing the um, the mechanical stuff, and I guess if you've got a flat tire, once they've changed it, they've got to go and fix the puncture, right, and pump it back up again. Exactly. Yes, yeah, so they're off. They'll. Uh, We'll, they'll just have a bunch of spare tubes there and switch out the tube. But every player there will have you know, at least two spare wheels on the sideline for so quick changes um, in case they happen in quick su succession. But then the mechanics will be in the background fixing those tubes as well. This is Kano for Japan coming away, looking to find DK. It's going to be in the clear. Still that gap though, five, five points there. And time running out for Japan. I mean, if they could pull this off, this would be massive for Japan to get up into the medals. And if USA fell out of the medals, that would be unheard of. That would be an inquest, I think. Basically, to put this in perspective, USA has won every major tournament bar two in the history of the game. That's world champs and Paralympics. Uh, they lost the 2002 world champs to Sweden, uh, to, sorry, to Canada in Sweden. And they lost the they lost in the semi-final uh, back in 2004 to Canada, which put, some, put them in the playoff for bronze, just as they did last night as well. Which must have made you guys feel good if you didn't have to uh, face up to the Americans in the final in 2004. Yeah, I think uh, we weren't overly worried about playing the Americans. We played them in pool play at that tournament, and they'd beaten us. But we were happy with, with the way we played the game at that stage of the tournament. You know, we were there to win a tournament, not, a, not each game. We knew what we had to do. But at the same time, when we seen that we were playing Canada, I think we did feel more comfortable. It was a play, it was a team we knew how to play more. I think, you know, different teams match up sometimes better and, and differently. And sort of some teams have their own little nemesis, as, uh, you know, nemesis for USA seems to be Canada. And for us, at that stage, we felt comfortable playing Canada for the final. Yeah. Dan Buckingham, part of the uh, gold medal winning side for New Zealand in 2004. 
Two, in, uh, two years later, we, we had to play the Americans in the World Champs final and it didn't quite go as well. Uh, lost to the Americans there down in Christchurch, which is a game I'd still love to go back and play. <laughs> in those days, we were, I mean, we were putting everything into a sport at that stage, I think, uh, you know, just we're in really good form. You're playing at home. Playing at home in front of a great crowd, and we just couldn't pull it off in the final. And um, there were times, you know, we got the ball on the deck off the Americans, I think, three times, and we just couldn't pick it up, and it went straight back to them. Um, so, yeah, games like that sort of stick in your memory. <laughs> Yeah, it's funny, that one seems to stick in your memory more than the one that you actually won against the Americans, Dan. Yeah, I've, I've been asked before whether I hate losing more than I like winning, and I'm still not sure. <laughs> That's very honest of you. Still that six-point gap, EK. Yeah, Shin, Shin just had to call a timeout there. Uh, when you're attacking the key like that, you, an offensive player is only allowed in that key area, the orange part of the court, for 10 seconds. So... The American players trapped Shin in there. He must have been getting close to 10. He just sensed it. He knew it and called a timeout. So they'll get another crack at the key. Defense of the Americans again. Oh! And he doesn't get through. He pushed it too hard. Gap wasn't big enough. He went for it. Couldn't get the two wheels across the line. Yeah, Charles Sumner backing up against uh, Kishi, the number 15 for Japan. Just closed down the gap, didn't he? And Chuck Aoki through the gaps. I remember Curtis Palmer, a New Zealand player, went over to play in the States. He was an import player over there and playing against Chuck Aoki. When I hadn't played against Chuck then, I asked what he was like to play against Curtis City. He makes the game look so easy, he looks bored. It's just, <laughs> he tears it up on court. So Japan chasing this game, which I'm presuming may leave the opportunities for the Americans if you're having to commit to the attack and know that you've got to get on the scorecard. And the score hasn't changed much for a while. It feels like the Americans, you know, they've got their lead. They're, they're comfortable, they're just holding their Japanese players. They know how to win out a game, they don't have to push it here. Well, some great defensive work coming in from the likes of, of Sumner, Adam Scaturo. Certainly Sumner, with that impassive face of his, just manages to close down the space time after time. Doesn't show a lot of emotion, does he? He certainly doesn't. Got a nice, uh, nice reverse gear there that he's used. Uh, yeah, okay, a bit of emotion there. We saw the fist pump. Bit of a fist pump. First time from uh, Charles Sumner showing how happy he was with uh, with that blocking move on uh, this guy, the number 11. Big Shin, Nakazato. Chuck Aoki just working his way out of trouble again. Just gets out of that traffic. This is uh, just so easily. Well, raucous uh, crowd watching this today at the basketball arena. Oh, crowd yeah, streaming in from the final. Yeah, exactly. Looking forward to the uh, final. Streaming in from early. Gorgeous day here in London. One of the nicest days of the of the game so far. And the game's coming to a close. One of the last events. I'm yeah, not sure what we're going to do next week. It's been uh, it's been a terrific few weeks with the Olympic Games and the and the Paralympics. Definitely some phenomenal action as, you know, I've been here since the start and spending a lot of time at the Aquatic Centre and the Velodrome. And it just seemed like an age before the wheelchair rugby competition even started. But then when it did start, it just started with a vengeance, you know, it just seemed to be everywhere and everyone was talking about it. Well, it is, of course, the sport that has been the, the face of the Paralympic Games, certainly in this country in the, in the build-up. It, it is the, the impact sport, it's the one with the glam, it's the... It's got the evil name of murder ball. It's it's used to to sell games, and I think the great thing is that at events like this, and uh, you know, certainly at uh, at the Paralympics and the Olympics, you're getting people showing up who don't ordinarily get to see a lot of sport because in a country like uh, Great Britain, it's very expensive to see Premier League football. The stadiums uh, could be sold out three or four times. Same with Rugby Union; they could sell Twickenham three or four times for for big games against the likes of of your boys. So. I've been enjoying seeing crowds on the train down coming up 
kids and families and people learning about wheelchair rugby and basketball and everything else that's been going on. It's been great to see. The British are renowned for enjoying their live sport, aren't they? Really getting out. Um, you know, at times we struggle to fill our stadiums in New Zealand. Uh, we have the opposite oh. problem. We have too many people wanting to watch sport and... Uh, Big play there. That was back over half by AK. So just coming up to the line there, and the Americans put pressure on him right on halfway and pushed him back over the halfway line. Just just touched it enough that it's called back over half. Sumner again. Turnover. Andy Cohn for America, the uh, number 11. Joe so Delagrave is the number 14. After eight points out with the balls going up to nine. 36 on the clock for this third quarter. Good turn of pace coming in from uh, Andy Cohn. Andy Cohn's a player that's been around a long time. Uh, he's been there. He was back there in 2002, back in Sweden, world champs. Uh, third Paralympics for him. And Chance just going in too hard, putting going for too much pressure with only 25 seconds on the clock. Fouled. What he was doing there was going for the jump balls. He's trying to change the. We talked about earlier uh, the team that wins the the tip at the start of the game. After that, it's sort of turn about for the start of the next quarter as to which team has the ball. But you can change that within the quarter if you get shared possession. So that's what Chance was just going for there, trying to get his hand on the ball so that he effectively shared possession with the Japanese player. And it would have uh, changed changed who had position for the next quarter so the Americans would have started the next quarter with the ball but just pushed him too hard and ended up in the sim bin for his troubles so Iki just runs it in 0.7 on the clock and Japan finally get a last to score America having scored last in the last two quarters but the last to score is not playing a big difference in this game with Americans what are they 8 points up now yep but Japan will have the ball to start the next quarter, so that should drop them back to seven. It's a, a mountain decline for uh, for the Japanese side in this matchup against the United States. Japan making their Paralympic debut uh, in Athens. Finishing eighth, they lost all six matches, so you can see the progression of uh, this side. Four years later in Beijing, they defeated China in the group stage. That was their first victory at the Paralympic Games before losing to Germany in the classification round. Uh, they then beat China again to finish seventh four years ago. Scott Hogsett having a lot to say there, as he always does on the sideline. Another player that's been around for a long time. This will be his third Paralympics as well. And, uh, another player, you know, he's just devoted his life to the sport. He just knows a lot about the sport. He's played it so much. Uh, a lot of it alongside Andy Cohen, uh, playing for the same club over there in the States. A lot of players in the States based, it seems, in uh, Arizona. You've got the Tucson Pterodactyls, the Phoenix Fusion, accounting for uh, uh, most of uh, this uh, American squad. Denver Harlequins, Portland Pounders, I'm presuming of Oregon. And uh, Sharp Edge, where is Sharp Edge? The Andy Kirsten. It's down in uh, San Diego. Ah. So Andy, uh, yeah, he's originally from Phoenix, Arizona. Played a lot of his rugby out there and then moved over to California. But a lot of players from around the world have played in the USA League. You know, it's such a strong league. There's so many tournaments. And just to give you a, sort of a perspective of, of how it works, the team run, uh, the, the season runs over five, six months. And you have uh, you play regionals to get to sectionals to get to nationals, and then the top 16 teams in the states go through to nationals. Whereas in a, a country like New Zealand, we had you know we scraped together six teams for our nationals. <laughs> yeah, but you won the gold medal. Well, we did. So something was working at one stage in uh, wheelchair rugby in New Zealand, and uh, I think a big part of it was a lot of us had travelled to the states. You know, we'd uh, yeah uh, out of this. Um, starting lineup, three of us have played seasons in the States, and that's what you got to do. you got to travel, you got to get the overseas experience. And as a team, we travelled a lot as well, which we really struggle to do now with lack of funding, so 
it's a building into Athens, you know, we're over in the States playing, we're over in Aussie, we went to Japan, which is awesome, you know, it's not just, you know, good rugby, but you're traveling the world with your mates, and it's just a magic time. Good times for the American side. Ahead by eight, it's going to be ahead by nine when uh, Andy Cohen scores that point. And Andy just taking his time running that in. They've just got control of this game now, and it's like they're just ticking away the time, just taking their time, running down the clock, closing out this game, getting the medal. USA champions of three of the last four Paralympic Games. Not this time, competing for the bronze, coming later, gold medal match, Canada against Australia. So you had a bit of first time for whoever wins it. Uh, getting the gold medal out of Canada and Australia. Both have been in the final now. I think uh, this will be the third time for, for both of them. Australia lost to USA in Sydney back in 2000. And they lost to USA again back in uh, 2008 in Beijing. Canada, I'm pretty sure they were in the final against USA in uh, 1996 in Atlanta. And uh, they were in the final against us in Athens. EK for Japan. Keeping an eye on that uh, score clock, some 20 seconds to go. Looking for the opening. And finding it. With a nice reverse move. He's pushed his way past Scott Hogsett there. And pressure on Andy Cowan. Uh, too much. Pushing that envelope too hard. Trying to force it, but they have to do it. At this stage of the game, that far down, they've got to start making some plays. So what exactly wrong was that uh, with that challenge there from EK? Basically, he got a bit of body contact, so he's going for that ball, but as uh, the referee called that his arm hit Andy Cohen's arm, so no body contact allowed. It was a bit of a yeah, it wasn't it was a bit of a harsh call, I think. I mean, a lot of the times referees will let those sort of calls go, uh, keep the game flowing. I mean, after all, it is rugby, you know. It's, although officially no body contact, you know, occasionally you just let stuff go. If it's not holding the play up, if it's not having a huge impact on the game, referees will just keep the game flying. And not that time. Seth McBride from the Portland Pounders. Getting on the score sheet for the United States. 43-34, six minutes. I think that clock. shows a bit of the fatigue there of EK. Uh, in a foot race with Chance Sumner, I think he usually would have won that, but End of the game, end of the tournament, he just couldn't get past it. And had to work some magic to get there to the goal line. And I'm surprised they still haven't brought on Shinichi Shimakawa, number 13 for Japan, sitting there on the side. He's got wheels to burn. He's been around forever. He's a smart player. But Japan get one back. Six minutes to go. They can't, uh, they can't miss around here. They've got to score quick and keep getting those turnovers. USA with the key defense. So three players in that orange part of the court. Only three players allowed. And EK finds a way through. And what, the, what the Japanese team were doing there, they had players on the outside of the key trying to spread the defense and create room for Ike to, to score. fake from chance to lose the defender and he'll get over half pretty easily too easily three USA players up there yep Japan wide open Kazuhiko Kano is the number six to the aforementioned uh, Nakazato Shin Daisuke Ikezaki, Ike as, uh, as he's known. Again, the two Japanese players spreading the key, trying to create room for Ike to score. He always doing an awesome job on defense. 12 seconds on the, on the clock. He finds a way through. Again, that was the, the man on the side just creating the room for him. Oh, 
Oh, oh. it's going to be another turnover. Nice. It's Kano to Shin. He came up and up. Shin's going to go around the outside or try to Seth McBride, the man blocking him off. John Sumner doing his trademark uh, reverse manoeuvre. Yeah, they got the turnover now. They've got to score. They've got to get the point on the board. And they get it. Kano it is. Six goals down, four and a half minutes. It's not a lot of time to pull that back. And calling a timeout here. Whether it's to catch a breather or maybe a change up, not sure. That was the hit coming in on, uh, I think it was uh, Chan Sumner spilling that ball due to uh, a lot of pressure. I guess you instinctively know as a player that you, when you're going to get a hit, you can feel it coming, can you, Dan? Yeah, you get to the stage where you, know, you play it so much, you basically know where everyone is on court, and you can sort of feel it and you know it. And, um, often you know things are going to happen before they happen, but you still can't do anything about it. <laughs> You know it's coming and you know you may lose the ball and you know, it's just the way it is. What are the changes that have, have come in since you won your gold medal? And I'm thinking in terms of, uh, you know, physicality and tactics. Is it an evolving game? It is evolving all the time. Uh, definitely rule changes, uh, chair specifications. So uh, since I began the sport, so much has changed. You know, the, the chairs used to look so different. Uh, they had a lot of, um, there was a lot less regulation around the size of the wings and the guards. So they looked a lot more like the, the Mad Max sort of crazy chairs. <laughs> They've been refined a lot. But the big thing since, since we won in 2004 has been the 40-second score clock and the 12 seconds over half. So the game has got a lot faster. It used to be a lot more tactical, definitely around that last to score in the quarters, and teams would hold out for minutes on end and play what was called keep away uh, to score last. And it was, a, it was definitely a crowd killer. It wasn't the most exciting part of the game, but it was very tactical. As a player, I really enjoyed it. I like that part of the game. I, I, I enjoyed the Whoa. tactical side and managed to hold it up, but uh, I admit it was a crowd killer. And, and it's made the game more exciting, having that 40-second clock in. Sounds like a form of uh, chess. Definitely, chess on wheels. Chess on wheels, yeah. And it's still there as well. It's just, uh, it's just a lot faster pace now. Yeah. And, and for us, that really suited us well, the New Zealand team. You know, we never had a lot of depth. We were allowed 12, to, uh, 12 players on the side, and we had nine players there in Athens. So we didn't sub a lot. And um, to be able to play that tactical game, it wasn't as taxing. So you could, you could hold the ball up. You could be more tactical. Uh, we had a very smart player with Tim Johnson on our team and, and a really smart coach with Grant Charman. And we played a smart tournament, I think. Shaka Oki doing the uh, blocking on the uh, line of, of Shin. And just off the ball, EK smashed the US player out of court. So he'll be going off to the sin bin. Another reason to go to the sin bin is uh, knocked out of court off the play. Uh, there's, there's a whole lot of different rules that come to play. Uh, and once you just learn, pick up as you go along, as you play the game. So four players on court for Japan and three for the US. They should get an easy score here. Uh, they don't want to be messing around about it because they're running out of time. They want to be scoring quick. So less than three minutes now. And a score line that's going to be hard to pull back. You've seen it though. Yeah, seen, seen uh, score lines like this disappear. And that's another good thing about the 40-second clock is score lines like this can close up quickly. Whereas in the past where a team could just hold it up and burn the clock, you wouldn't see this, the score disappear. And, and the, the result will be a foregone conclusion. Which sucked to find out of at times as well. So that makes it more exciting as well, keeping the, keeping the game alive right to the end. All right, six-point gap. Less than three minutes on the clock. Three minutes for Japan to uh, do something. They're giving it their all. You've uh, got to say that. Good blocking coming in from Chakaoki, allowing Joe Delagrave to glide home. 
Joe Delegate, I think, just at the start of his career, he's going to really step up and be a big force for the US team. Got all the physical attributes. He's got to get it over the halfway line fairly quickly. And, and that's where the mistakes yeah. come in, American pressure. I'm pretty sure at this stage Japan are out of timeouts and they just had to force that ball. They were running close to the 12 seconds to get over half and they are at the stage they just had to try and get the ball over half any way they could and hope it connected. Yeah, uh, Kano was the man who had to... With a, an American. Had to bat it away. No problem with the 12-second uh, time on uh, this move. Kano to glide in. 48-40. Still no changes from the Japanese side. Hiroyuki Masaka there on the sideline. He spent some time in New Zealand playing over there, playing with the Canterbury side. Another player that's been around for a while. That was the turnover ball there from Kano's desperation with the clock running down. Straight to the arms of uh, Delagrave who took that quite happily over the line. So seven point deficit. USA heading towards that bronze medal position. Some recompense for losing another chance to win a gold medal. That's going to be decided later between Canada and Australia. Yeah. Americans don't look happy about that bronze medal. Thought they did. Joe Delagrave, another big play. Extending that lead for the American side. Some crunching hits coming in. Oh, another turnover. Too easy. Basically gave him the ball. So starting to blow out with less than two minutes to go now. E.K. in a bit of bother. And can't get over, 12, uh, over half within 12 seconds either, so another turnover. This is disappointing after the way the game started. I thought it was really going to, there was a potential for it to come down to the wire with Japan really pushing and even getting up at one stage. That was just dreadful by Kano. He had his head in his hands there. He knew exactly what he'd done. I think the Americans have just, they've worn them into the ground. Yeah, Japan haven't got much left in the tank at this stage. Turning the screw despite the efforts of this man. He's got support from Shin. Delagrave slowing him down. Good hit there by Delagrave. A nice pass off to score. Uh, just over a minute. So the different chairs there you can see as well, the low pointers have the big wide ball bars at the front of their chairs. It's uh, more of a defensive chair, so they're made for picking and blocking. Whereas a chair like Chakaoki there, more streamlined as he goes over the line, made for getting through the gaps. So the likes of uh, Kishi's chair here, number 15, very different to Toyoki's. Yeah, that's called a low point chair. So there's a low point player, and that's uh, that refers to as classification. It's one of the low, less function. Uh, so lower point, lower classification. He's, his role is more to, to take out the players. So he does a lot of work off the ball. And uh, often the low point is doing all the work and the, the high point is get the ball and all go well, just cruise through and, and get the goals. So it's often said, you know, it's about um, making your teammates look good. It's what you're trying to do on court. It's doing what you can off the ball to make your other players get the goal and look good. Shin just losing control there under pressure. Uh, the turnover's coming thick and fast for the US now. You see Delagrave there just waited, just waited for his screen. He just sat there, he knew his block was coming. Hilton came around and he just used him to get through the gap and eased over half. Ten point gap with just 35 seconds on the clock. Uh, I think they'll run the bit of time down now, just take their time. And really just 
get rid of the crazy of this game. The time in London's coming to an end. And I'd say they'll be pretty gutted they're not in the next game, the USA. They would have been loving to play off the gold. And it would have been a huge matchup, you know, it's been built uh, against Australia. And big Hail Mary there, pays off. Full court goal. Yeah, popular score for Kano uh, right at the end. Back within uh, 10 points, 10 seconds on the clock. USA, bronze medalist at this event for many teams. That's a resounding success for the American side, perhaps seen as something of a disappointment. Yeah, a huge disappointment for the US guys. They, they would have been very confident coming into this. Um, being in that final and I end up probably getting gold. It's the last chance here for a goal for Japan. Three seconds on the clock. They'll go for a quick pass in and intercepted. So that'll close out the game and a foul in the game. So uh, clapping by the American team there. Bronze medal winners. Uh, bronze medal winners. Yeah, they've not had bronze since the year. Dan Buckingham side won in uh, Athens in 2004. Gold medalists in three of the last four games. It's a novel experience for the likes of uh, Chokioki. But to come away with any medal is a success at uh, these games, given the intensity of the battle and credit as well to uh, the likes of EK. You gave it all his all today for the Japanese side. Kano as well. Look, utterly devastated not to get that bronze medal. Yeah, for the J Japan team, you know, this is best they've ever finished at a Paralympics, you know, playing off for the bronze medal. But, you know, you just see the passion and what they've put into this. They're still gathered. They couldn't just go that one step further and get on the podium. So coach Gumby, Jim Gumba, looking a bit happier than uh, he was uh, yesterday after that defeat to the Canadian side. His team uh, running out winners by uh, 10 points, causing a lot of tears on the uh, faces of some of the Japanese players, but as well a lot of mutual respect. It's always nice to see in this and uh, certainly in the wheelchair basketball. You, you guys always seem to know each other well. You play in the same leagues. You meet quite often at uh, major events and uh, a lot of respect between the two teams. Yeah, you form some great friendships around the world. You know, that's the great thing about this sport. It's, um, uh, it's, a, it's a great sport just to play, but you get to travel the world. There's so many opportunities. Uh, and then you just, there's great guys that play the sport as well and some really close friendships. So there's the uh, final statistic showing the uh, American domination. And as uh, uh, Dan 